You know, I kind of wonder how long I keep this going for, because something tells me that this wasn't what they intended. The Revenant Prince is a game that taught me, there are many things in JRPGs we take for granted, and it's only once they are removed or becomes a problem, that we realize what we were missing all along. Now, I'm not here to say you shouldn't play this RPG Maker MV game by a small Indonesian studio, as chances are, nobody's ever heard of this game anyways. Rather, I want to use The Revenant Prince as an example of how just by getting a few things that you normally we wouldn't even notice wrong, you can make what would normally be a decent experience into a not so great one. It is also a great chance for me to complain about a couple of things endemic to the whole recent spurt of crowdfunded Japanese RPGs, which, while I did not find any Kickstarter or Indiegogo page for this game, The Revenant Prince shares many similarities and problems as those other games. Before I get into any of that though, let's talk about what the heck even is The Revenant Prince. The Revenant Prince is an indie Japanese RPG which has been released on the Steam Store as of a week ago. I'm pretty sure that this game was made using the RPG Maker MV engine, since I got a couple of error codes that I recognized during some crashes. It is a self-proclaimed old-school JRPG that has supposedly been inspired by the greats, such as Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, Final Fantasy VI. After playing it, I'd like to think that a lot of inspiration for the game instead came from a bit more of a modern RPG. As for which one, here's a hint. The Revenant Prince started production in 2015. The answer is Undertale, and the game kind of feels like they saw how popular Undertale became, and decided to just copy parts of it, even though it completely clashes with the style they already had. Anyhow, the base story of the Revenant Prince is that the main character Troy, after defecting from the Empire and getting his childhood friend killed, is stalked by a shadowy figure that seems to want to guide Troy on a specific path. Whether that path leads to slaughter or salvation is anyone's guess. Before I start using the Revenant Prince as a punching bag, I'll first mention the two good things the game has going for it, and what led me to actually finishing it. First of all, the initial premise is interesting enough. The Revenant Prince starts out surprisingly dark, with the main character participating in a village massacre, and how even after escaping, he seems to be stuck by a mysterious figure that forced him to make horrible decisions against his own will. When you end up looping for the first time after the first A of the game, and are now forced to kill your first ally, things start to get a little crazy. It's a mystery that makes you curious as to find out what's going on with Troy, with his shadowy figure. The other part of the Resident Prince that I thought was fairly nice was the battle aspect, where it's essentially an ATB system, most similar to classic Final Fantasy, except that you can see all of your enemy's action bards, and your attacks can affect the enemy's actions. Troy has three customizable attacks, all with their different cooldowns, depending on the weapon he's using. Troy also has very unique and fluid animations for the five different types of weapons he can wield, with his gun special looking particularly cool. While the combat can get kinda clunky, overall it's decently fun. Now with those compliments out of the way, let's talk about everything else. We can start out with what I mentioned in the beginning, the little things that we take for granted that the Revenant Prince manages to mess up on. These are all going to be things that normally shouldn't be a problem, but for some reason are here, and serve as a great example for how bad it can be when they do become a problem. For one thing, this game has no way of changing dialogue speed, and a normal speed at which text goes is too slow. Holding enter skips the dialogue, so what I ended up doing instead was tapping enter to speed it up. The problem is that, this game has you making choices, however these choices have no transition effect before they appear. So while tapping enter, I think I automatically hit the first choice every time during the first 5 hours, without ever seeing what the choice is. It sounds minor, but it was oh so aggravating during this entire game, and could have been easily solved by just having an instant text option, but even if not, have some sort of indicator or stop effect when the choice appears. The basic direction of where to go in this game is also a mess, where there are plenty of maps, where it isn't clear what leads to a new screen or not. You can walk south out of a screen, and then on a new screen, it shows you just coming out of the south again rather than appearing from the north side. It's very confusing and makes maps have a less cohesive feel. Sometimes it's hard to even tell where the exits are on a screen. For instance, in the very first town, I got lost here because I couldn't tell where to go next. What I didn't know is that walking towards the east end of the screen, there is an exit. And the reason I didn't know that is because there are trees covering the right side and the foreground. You are forced to go on the left side initially, and you, when you walk to the left, you run into trees that are impassable. So... Eh? And this is something the Revenant Prince does everywhere, where instead of the scenery guiding the player, it actively hinders them instead. Again, this could have been easily fixed. Them putting stuff in the foreground to block the player's vision is a conscious decision they made on their part. Not only that, the game does a very poor job of telling the player where they could possibly go most of the time. 
Cecil here says follow me, then she ends up walking in the northwest direction, even though there are two exits north and west. Why not just have her go west? From what I'm looking at here, it looks like she's heading north. All of these little things make just moving around this game such a needless hassle, compared to, you know, how it normally feel like in a, any other JRPG. Progression is also incredibly messy in this game. Even though Troy has a magic attack stat, you don't receive any magic until near the very end of the game. And it's not like it's that far because of any story significance either. You just do a fetch quest at a town located near the end and the shopkeeper lets you buy magic off of her. Okay, why are there like 12 spells with varying costs but you can only buy them at the very end? Rather than scattering them throughout the game. Speaking of buying stuff, weapon and armor level scaling is pretty much non-existent. Normally, in a JRPG, weapons and armor scale depending on which part of the game you are at, with newer towns having better weapons and armors and so on. This is very common sense, yet in The Revenant Prince, weapon quality seems to be placed completely randomly. I found a shop during the early stage of the game, when I was like level 14, where I bought two guns off of him and used those two guns all the way until the very end of the game. On a side note, this shopkeeper also bugged out and I could buy infinite items off of him and sell those items for infinite profit. Enemy difficulty runs into a similar affair where you can be in an area appropriate to your level, walk right instead of left, and instantly be at a place with way higher level enemies, do one fight, and instantly jump in power exceedingly fast. I think you know where I'm going with this one. In a JRPG, have a reasonable progression curve. Players should feel like they are getting stronger along with their enemies. It's fine to be challenging, but it should also be consistent. Another thing that bugged the heck out of me was how many shopkeepers there were literally everywhere in the game. Why would you have in one town five different shopkeepers who all sell a ton of very similar goods? Right here in this one shop, there are three shopkeepers who all sell incredibly similar items. How the heck did they manage to mess up by putting too many shopkeepers in one place? This is also going to be an assumption, but these special animated shopkeepers look like they were ripped straight from Undertale, especially with the options you have to interact with them, and even how they refuse to let you sell anything to them. What's the point of this? Why have these characters who completely clash with the rest of your game, in terms of art style and aesthetics? I'm going to guess that these shopkeepers are like community characters, which were added into the game because of the support they gave or something. That's the only explanation I could think of, which doesn't change the fact that I never knew having too many shopkeepers could be a bad thing until I played this game. Which brings me to my next point. The Revenant Prince has so many useless board signs and NPCs everywhere that spout such utter metafiction nonsense that I have to assume all of these exist because the creator let community members add their own characters into the game after meeting a fun go or something. The reason why this is a problem is because when you do something like this, it makes it so that your player doesn't want to interact with any of these NPCs. Early in the game, I walked into the town and interacted with everything I could because why not, it's a JRPG. However, after reading a line such as, wow, this guy's been walking back and forth forever, or wash your hands twice a day, I sort of feel like I just wasted my time. All these characters don't even feel like they belong to the world of the Revenant Prince, but rather are just walking nonsense spouters made by a robot. Even though every screen has like 20 NPCs, with how utterly inane and out of place every conversation is, Every screen might as well just be empty. It doesn't help that The Revenant Prince is meant to be a very dark story, and all of this nonsense sh jokes just clash horribly with that atmosphere. The other possibility is that again, they saw Undertale and was like, let's just copy their haha weird humor, without really understanding why it works for Undertale. This doesn't even begin to tackle all the weird NPCs that are completely out of place, like the walking fish, giant cats, or whatever, that again serve absolutely no purpose. Quests are also just the same. In many JRPGs, we kind of laugh at side quests essentially being glorified fetch quests. However, this game doesn't even begin to make the glorified attempt. Instead, all you do is walk up to a board in town, accept all the quests, and you have the item in your inventory, you instantly complete it on the spot. If you aren't even going to make an attempt of having a conversation for your side quest, or for them to have, again, any relevance on the world itself, just don't even have them, they're kind of a waste of time. Just because it's a JRPG doesn't mean you have to have quests. You already have side stories anyways, which are essentially the same thing, except they have story actually. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about with regards to The Revenant Prince has less to do with basic JRPG mechanics, and more to do with how it tries to copycat plenty of ideas from Undertale, without really understanding why it does it. This attempt to piggyback off of a game that was way popular back then, 
is why you see all these weird animated shopkeepers out of nowhere with talk options. It's why there are dozens of randomly weird shaped characters who are completely out of place with the rest of the game. It's why the game makes a huge deal out of the whole mercy and kill system, even though it isn't really implemented well at all. I'm not saying that Undertale is a godlike game that can't ever be touched, or that you shouldn't take concepts from more popular games. What I am saying, however, is that you need to understand why a game does the things it does. Why Undertale's shopkeeper is not accepting items from you, works as a parody, while in The Revenant Prince, it doesn't really make any sense in context and feels out of place, especially since there are shopkeepers literally right next to them that are willing to accept your items. How all of the constant jokes by the inhabitants of the world in Undertale serve to endear the player to these characters while fitting in with the RPG parody, while in The Revenant Prince, it just completely clashes with the exceedingly dark and serious setting the entire main story has. If The Revenant Prince, instead of just trying to copy and paste ideas, adapted and incorporated these ideas into the dark storyline they were going for, and you know, tweaked all these little things that kind of ruined the experience, then I think The Revenant Prince would have been a solid indie RPG. Not an amazing experience, mind you, but still one I think people could enjoy. I think the basic premise is pretty interesting, even if it doesn't end up as that amazing of a story, and I still do enjoy a good metafiction kind of thing. As it stands though, The Revenant Prince is not a fun experience and instead serves as a stark reminder that there are some things in JRPGs that we take for granted, and it is only once they are missing do we realize they are gone. It's sad too, because many of these problems could have been fixed with a few minor touch-ups, but instead are here and are a massive pain in the butt. If you enjoyed this talk about JRPGs using the Revenant Prince as an example, the like and subscribe buttons are there as always, notification all buttons if you want to see when my next video comes out, and yeah, with that, I'll be seeing you next time. Actually wait, here are two more of my videos on the left side right here, and here's my Twitter in case you want to follow me, and for real this time, I'll see you next time.